solution strategy. Buy faster hardware. These are the two contrasting approaches to scaling a problem. Meaning, oh, now the problem's bigger. We got more data to deal with, more sensor observations. What do we do? Scale up, buy a bigger piece of processor and rely on faster processing speeds. Well, they're not getting any faster. It's forcing us into alternative strategies that look at not faster, but more. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you develop technical solutions for this world in this notion of scaling out? Get even more technical. Well, how do you solve this problem? What's, what's, what's the deal? <laughs> what I'm showing here is the cluster hierarchy, the memory hierarchy. You start at those dense computational cores. There it is, all sorts of processing power. And again, we're talking about problems that crunch on data. So we got to get data into those processing cores to get the efficiency and utilization of those. As you go from the, the processing cores, you see we have the main memory, and this is where they call the divergence gap because you're getting much more computational density and you're having a hard time feeding it, even there in the memory on the board, on the chip. You move out to direct access storage, which is a disk right on the processing board. Remember how Google does it. They, they divide and conquer and they put all these cluster nodes that have the disk local, processing local. So this is all one processing node that has the computational capability, the main memory, and a local disk right there. What I'm showing here is the difference in CPU cycles as you move out further and further and further. When you get out to here, you're over the network. Now you're talking about some serious cycles. You know, if we look at it like dog years, it's, it's quite a long time for a processor to go out there and access any kind of data. He's going to sit there twiddling his thumb. So all that dense computational capability is not being utilized. If you've got all your data out here, you're talking about a very large divergence gap. So take a look at this picture. And where do you think you want to keep all your data? Of course, you want to keep it close as possible to the processing cores. You have to to get this kind of throughput that we're talking about. Now, look what happens tradition traditionally. Server-centric, tier based put all the data on the server. Where's that data going to reside? Of course, it's going to reside back here. It's, it's, it's many dog years away from your actual CPU. So he's going to sit there idling. You're not going to get the efficiency. You're not going to get the, the good throughput. You're going to get retrograde throughput as you put more and more and more of these in that want that data. You're going to hit that retrograde throughput, part of that curve. And you can put all the money you want in here. You're not going to get the throughput. You'll get degradation effect. So where you want this, and this is, this is where the, the, the Gemfire solution fits in to the solution strategies uh, as we look at you know, kind of distributed data solutions and all that. What you're doing is now putting the data over here in the red zone, close to the cores. Keep it there. And that's what we're doing is, as far as uh, exploring high performance data solution strategies is to look at how can we keep this data close to these cores so when we're doing our, our number crunching, when we're trying, especially when we're trying to scale out, when we try to add more of these processing nodes to solve a, a larger problem, you know, that's really the essence of what I'm talking about here, is how do we define a solution that will allow us to accommodate unanticipated growth. Um, like many of our customers, they come to us looking for um, a distributed cache, right? They, that's their problem. They want a distributed cache. But all of these guys have had the vision to say there's something beyond that, right? And that something is making what we call a data fabric, and, it, and it's hard to define what that means, but it's when that cache ceases just to become memory that's slave to the underlying database and starts to become the data itself. Doesn't mean you throw away your database, you still keep that for archival purposes, but interesting things happen when you start to create that data fabric in the backbone and, and, and you get systems like Adrian's common data backbone that is spawning the evolution of things that the bank can now do that they, that they couldn't do before, right? Um, one of the interesting things we've, We've seen a number of our customers who have taken the largest machines they could get and the biggest installations of Oracle and tried to do really interesting things like real-time pricing of derivatives or in uh, one of our interesting cases online is providing uh, online bets for the European guys who want to bet when the next free kick is going to happen in the soccer game uh, against Man with Manchester United. Um, those things all have to happen very fast. And we have a number of customers who've done that with the, the biggest oracle they could get and still only be able to price or manage a small fraction of what their business wanted to do. <clears throat> 
And it's when they moved to that next generation of data fabric with Gemfire that gave them that linear scalability that allowed them to grow and hits on Terry's point of you know, not being able to predict where that upper bounds is, but still being prepared to do it. Where are we using it today? We're using the server-side cache within GCCSJ. We're using Gemfire as our server-side cache within GCCSJ to facilitate the data that we deliver through uh, track web services for the tracks that we manage within um, GCCS. So it has a role in a server enclave. It can enable horizontal scalability if, in fact, ultimately over time there's a big subscriber base hitting those web services. We haven't seen that today, but it's promised. So we're in preparation of that, preparing to horizontally scale within a server enclave. It's also the foundational cache for the GCCSJ Agile client and for that deployment, which is ongoing today. We took that product as a prototype to the joint staff, fall of 07. It began deploying fall of 09, which is pretty good, but we kind of were able to be greased in being part of a program of record already. But the product itself, the 3D rendering, the ability to deal with outside sources, that resonated immediately in terms of delivering value without overloading them with the big heavy application or integrated series of applications. And so we were able to fast track that. And Gemfire is a big part of that. Um, again, we enable the SA delivery in a DIL environment, disconnected, interrupted, and limited connectivity. Uh, asynchronous replication, continuous queries, data positioning to the analytical edge, uh, and the Agile subscription element, which I kind of breezed by before, which is the fact that these clients can now begin to subscribe to multiple servers in the Enclave rather than being slave to only one. Uh, where we stand future-wise, where we're taking it with our own Northrop internal uh, research and development, as well as where we're intending to partner with our primary customer in this space, which is DISA, is to transition the SA server-side functions onto Gemfire and get ourselves kind of out of that infrastructure piece uh, uh, altogether.